Hello again, uh, fellow roadsters. Um, I just realized I got this cup in the Orpheum Theater uh, in Memphis. How, how apropos. Um, I'm starting today with a little teaser. After I finish reading this chapter, I might have some, something exciting to tell you. So there's your incentive to stay with me. Um, chapter 8, Through the Desert, February 4th, 2003. Dear friends, I always enjoy moving day. Every few weeks, just as things are becoming routine, we fold up our tents and we take our little traveling circus back on the road. There's an excitement about it, a new city, new hotel, new theater, new dressing rooms, and a new audience to entertain. Late at night, on the Friday before we leave, we push our trunks outside our hotel room doors. And sometime early the next morning, while we sleep, big strong guys whisk them away and throw them onto a truck bound for the next city. It's just like leaving a tooth under your pillow for the tooth fairy and waking up to find, well, change. A few days later, the trunks mysteriously appear outside our doors at the next hotel, miles away. And somewhere between those two events, we're, we're, we're whisked away as well. Uh, on moving day, we usually gather around uh, 10 a.m., an hour that exists purely in fiction for show people, dragging our suitcases, our computers, and even pets. Some company members are touring with their animal pals. It's our day off, so we tend to keep quietly to ourselves and rest our brains and our voices, particularly because we're not quite awake. While I'm less than crazy about flying, the change of scenery upon arrival is a great payoff. I like moving into the new hotel room, uh, my, my home for the next several weeks, and putting things away and stowing my suitcases and taking a walk around the new neighborhood. In fact, it's become one of my traditions to stroll by the theater on that first night in town, the night before we open, and snoop around. I watch as the trucks are unloaded and pieces of the show are installed. I like seeing the unlit marquee and looking through the doors into the darkened lobby, knowing that the very next night, the place will be filled with light and buzzing uh, with anticipation as our opening night crowd and local reviewers get their tickets, file in, and take their seats. For the move from San Diego to Tempe, Arizona, I did something different. I decided to join uh, Jessica Sheridan, character actress extraordinaire in renting a car and driving while most of the company flew, and it turned out to be a great choice. The six hour drive was restful and beautiful, and while the main subject of conversation was work, it usually is among the cast, Jessica and I also found the opportunity to talk about life outside the show. So we're driving through the desert, chatting, bonding, enjoying the warm air and the views of red rocks and cacti, when suddenly the phone calls started coming in. The majority of our cast, already in Tempe, had found the Empire Suites Hotel completely unlivable. I don't know what kind of emperor would stay here, laughed Kevin over my cell phone. We're all sitting here outside trying to figure out what to do. According to the colorful reports that followed from various castmates, the place was horribly dark and dirty with a surly staff and an unidentifiable stench. The small rooms had one tiny window each. It sounded like a medieval prison. One by one, company members had returned to the front desk and checked back out. You know it had to be bad for the reaction to be that unanimous. There they were, with their stuff, ready to settle in and get something to eat. Now they had to find another place to stay for the next three weeks. Fortunately, they sounded like they all had a sense of humor about it. Jessica and I drove along, chuckling with selfish glee that we dodged this housing disaster. All of which would be completely worked out by the time we got there. What good fortune to be breezing through the desert, miles away from the insanity, enjoying the view. A bit further down the road, we got an update. The company had gotten organized. They were on a mission. Everyone had squeezed into the few cars among them, piled the luggage high, put dogs on laps, and struck out in various directions, keeping in touch by cell phone to report their findings. It was a mad scramble to find someplace comfortable that would offer a decent rate. 
La-di-da. Jessica and I stopped for a leisurely bite, then continued on. Our phones were quiet for a while. Then came the latest. Everyone had decided to settle at a place called the Studio Six. It's smaller than any place we've ever stayed, Melissa told me. But it's clean and bright and the staff is nice and it's 35 bucks a night, so there you go. I called ahead and reserved rooms for Jessica and myself. <laughs> Shortly after sunset, we pulled up to the Studio Six in Tempe. Melissa's description had been absolutely accurate. The staff was nicer and far more accommodating than one would expect to find at an economy motel, but it was an economy motel. Tiny room, tiny efficiency kitchen, white walls, no art, no frills, no kidding. One plastic plant. We dropped our stuff and we went shopping for groceries. Now, I think it's only right for a traveling theatrical, such as myself, to develop some eccentricities. One's public, not to mention the tabloids, comes to expect such things. And it makes even the most boring among us at least somewhat intriguing. In my case, I find that I'm developing, or, or maybe just discovering, uh, a respectable number of oddities, one of which is that I hate, no, loathe fluorescent light. And when I say loathe, I want you to picture Herbert Lom's expression every time the name Clouseau was mentioned in the Pink Panther movies. Uh, remember how one eye would twitch and the opposite cheek would quiver like he'd gotten bad news while eating a grapefruit? If you haven't seen the Pink Panther movies, do. It's a chuckle. Um, but yeah, I can now actually act it out. He'd go, Clouseau! That's not in the book. But, th but that's what Herbert Lom would look like. Uh, he hated him. Um, that's the look. The intensity of my feelings on the subject approaches the wild-eyed fervor of a conspiracy theorist. It's my belief that fluorescent light robs the body of vitamins, saps the energy, causes depression, restlessness, gout, dry heaves, and rickets, and, it, and emits an invisible beacon that shows the aliens where to land so they can steal your intestines. I could be wrong about the last part. Now, in recent years, I've noticed a disturbing trend in even the best hotels of replacing nice, normal, evil free light bulbs with the cheaper, inherently sinister kind. So when I move into a new room, one of the first things I do is to peer suspiciously over the lampshades, and if the horrible little things are present, I exclaim, aha, as if the hotel management was trying to put one over on me. I've learned how to remove them. Oh, they're clever, but not clever enough for me. I'm sure I'm risking some sort of fine, but I don't care. Once the, poisonous illuminator, once the poisonous illuminators have been yanked from their little sockets, I march with no small degree of righteous indignation to the nearest store, where I purchase several normal light bulbs and damn the cost. Hell, I've even gone as high as three bucks. But what's money when weighed against the importance of my intestines? Trick me, will you? Well, they've got another thing coming. I need hardly tell you that the room at the Studio Six was fluorescent everywhere you looked. I set that right but quick, and while I was at it, I bought a, my usual food staples. And so we were all settled in for our run in Tempe. Or so it seemed. But over the next few days, there was restlessness at the Studio Six. Several of us, having hastily taken refuge there, we're beginning to question whether such a small space would be comfortable for three weeks. So, after some characteristic waffling, does that qualify as an eccentricity? I packed up my food and my clothes and my light bulbs and transferred to the nearby residence inn where I got a room with a fireplace and lots of windows and where I was comfortable once I replaced the fluorescence. I felt so bad for Diane, the manager at the Studio Six, one day she has a sudden, unexpected flood of business. Two days later, half of them check out. This is how show people get a bad reputation. As we got into our Tempe run, I sensed that while the weather was lovely and warm and everyone was ultimately happy with their housing, things had gotten a bit dry with the show. Not bad, just kind of, eh. And it seemed to be a time when, for a lot of us, being in the first national tour of the biggest Broadway hit in years was just a job. A good job. An enjoyable job. But still a, a job. And that was fine. Things 
these things go in cycles, and right now we were in a dry phase, dry and flat. We were going through the desert, both literally and metaphorically. The audiences were drier too, compared with those wonderful crowds in San Diego. Now, mind you, we've never had an audience yet that didn't love the show, but there are varying degrees. And these folks weren't quite as wild in their response as the other cities, and that was fine too. This I've learned. It can't be utter bliss all the time. The theater, the Gamage Auditorium, is on the campus of Arizona State University. One of our swings, Michael Goddard, who you will recall was the sadistic secret Santa of St. Louis, went to school there. So he was a sudden celebrity, interviewed all over town for newspapers and radio, greeted nearly every night at the stage door by some relative or friend, and he even had a musical theater student from ASU, his protege, who followed him everywhere, soaking up his professional guidance. Now, Michael is, well, you'd have to meet him. He's one of those fabulous, gregarious, larger-than-life personalities. He's like the, the company cruise director, always coming up with activities and outings. He's party central. Whenever we have a holiday gathering or something, Michael's the one who proposes the toast. That's just him. So we hardly batted an eye when he swept into the dressing room one, one night and announced, boys, we've been invited to a party at the mayor's house Friday after the show. It's fabulous. You all have to come. That's right. The mayor of Tempe. Now, whatever mayoral image just popped into your mind, erase it. This mayor was young, handsome, and openly gay. No suit, no tie, no bifocals. He's been mayor for something like eight years. And I got the feeling that gatherings at his house weren't unusual. The mayor had a lot of friends. The party at which we found ourselves was like bring a friend night at a gay disco. Our cast members made up only a small part of the crowd that squeezed into the mayor's stylish little house. People oozed through the main room and out around the pool as house music thump, thump, thumped above our heads. We all got snacks and drinks and started casing the joint pausing for several minutes in the master bedroom to ponder the curvy, tiled shower that was big enough for three people. It was a really nice group of locals. No one was standoffish. Surprisingly few had seen the show, and not all of them knew it was playing in town. It's a musical. Are you sure you people are gay? I thought. All the same, they seemed happy to meet us, and the whole evening made for a great diversion. As the weeks went on, the audiences got better. That seems to happen consistently. We think it's because the earlier audiences in each city are subscribers who come to the show because it's part of their theater's season. Later in the runs, uh, audiences are made up of people who specifically bought tickets to see the producers, so they're a bit livelier. One night, in the usual pre-show hustle and bustle of the men's dressing room, a fellow ensemble member, Robin Lewis, and I were talking about a director that we both know, Michael Bernard. Where is he these days, Robin asked. I think he's somewhere in Arizona, I said. There was a chuckle from my left. Kostroff, said Kevin. We're in Arizona. Oh, we are, yes, yes, that's right. I'll have to call him. Michael Bernard is one of the best directors I've ever worked with. He directed that production of Forum I told you about in my Cleveland report, the one where I was unexpectedly moved into the lead. That experience helped me prepare for what I'm doing now. In going on as Max, I've often leaned on the things that I learned from Michael and the confidence he inspired. He pushed me hard, and I appreciated it now more than ever. If you're doing this right, he once told me, you'll be eating steak at midnight and still losing weight. These days, Michael is running a theater in Phoenix. It was dragging when he took over, but he turned it around, and now it's exceeding its goals. It's not surprising. He's a very talented guy. As I've gone along, I've realized how rare great directors like Michael are. So I was really happy to track him down, go out for dinner, and tell him how influential he had been. He came to see the show, and we laughed and reminisced and caught up, and I felt like he was proud of me, which meant a lot. So between visits with friends, the disco party at the mayor's pad, and various other adventures, the cast's trip through the desert was dotted with enough oases to sustain us. And after all, it was great to be in such a nice, warm place in the middle of January. In fact, I suppose we could have been tempted to stay. But by now, the trunk fairy had once again visited our rooms as we slept. 
and it was time once again to move on. This time to Seattle, the land of coffee and rain, which promised to be just the magic combination we needed. An energizing, an energizing caffeine jolt to wake us up and moisture from the heavens to end our dry spell. Keep in touch, friends. Kostroff. It was fun. You know, I don't pre-read these, so I'm re I'm re-experiencing as I'm reading them. Okay, here's the deal. Um, I've been doing an apartment purge. Um, well, I'll just go ahead and be grim. When the coronavirus hit and we all lost our jobs, I thought, well, what if I have to move out of my apartment? What if I can't afford the rent anymore? Okay, I better do a purge so that the move is lighter. Being practical, if a little grim. Um, and so I discovered that I have way too many, way too many boxes full of copies of letters from backstage. This is not a sales pitch, because I just, this is, this whole reading was set up to be a gift, and I, I, want, to, I want to continue in that spirit. You want one? I'd be happy to send it to you. I just ordered envelopes that are the right size to mail them to you. And I'd like to give you a copy if you want one, um, or if you want to give it to someone, that's great. I just really have too many. And um, yeah, I, uh, I, like sh I really love sharing them. Uh, you know, if, if you want to uh, toss me a little something for the, for the postage, and that's great. You know, you're welcome to, uh, or more if you want to cost, you know, it could be $1,000, you know, if you feel like it. Um, so uh, if I've done this right, I'm putting that information somewhere over here as I speak. Uh, my email, so that you can send me your address. And, uh, uh, okay, I'm putting a Venmo just in case you want to help help offset the, the cost of, of the shipping. I don't know how much it is. It doesn't matter. Or you could give me absolutely nothing. I'd be delighted, delighted to share this book with you and uh, thereby lighten my load in the event I need to uh, move out of my apartment or flee to Canada. You know, I don't want to flee with a bunch of boxes of books. I've got to be ready to flee light, you know. So you're really doing me a favor. That's all. Um, that's it. I will be back soon with the next chapter. I can't remember what it's called. I'm not even going to look it up. How about that? See you next time. Bye.